one thing I'm nervous about is keeping the microphone up, so I'm sorry if I'm standing like this the whole time. But let's see, am I up? Oh, I can see in front of me. I'm a consummate professional. I'm from the United States, so I'm sorry. Um, my name is Carrie Sparling, and this is me before my diabetes diagnosis. This isn't right before I was diagnosed with type 1. This is a couple years before. But my mom likes that I use this photo in presentations because it shows her daughter with diabetes sitting with two gigantic cakes. And we think the irony of that is cute, I guess. But this is me right after uh, my type 1 diabetes diagnosis. This is in September of 1986. And I'm at my very first sleepover at my best friend's house, just months after being diagnosed with a chronic disease that my parents and I and our entire family had no idea how to deal with. But my parents thought it was important for me to have a normal life, be a normal kid, diabetes notwithstanding. So they said, there's a sleepover? Go on that sleepover. It's time for you to be a normal kid. We're just going to, you know, be there before everyone has dinner and shoot you up with insulin. And then we're going to show up very early in the morning and test your blood sugar and shoot you up with insulin. You know, just like all the normal kids. So when I was first diagnosed, we didn't have blood glucose meters. We had to use clinitest tubes. This is how we tested our blood sugar. And it wasn't even blood sugar. It was the sugar content in your urine. So we would sit in the bathroom and have these two test tubes, and we'd have to put droplets of urine in and then the little tablets to change the color of the, uh, of the urine in there, and that let you know what kind of sugar level that you had in your bloodstream. It's very remedial, very hard to dose insulin off of this. This was our Lansing device. Does this look comfortable to everyone? Something you'd want to use when you're like six, seven, eight years old? You'd have to cock that thing back and it would come spring-loaded towards your finger, and that would procure the blood droplet from the tip of your finger, and you had to do this three, four, five, ten times a day. Not the most comfortable thing, but we're working towards progress, so this is just the early stuff. And then this is an insulin syringe. This is what I used two times a day after I was first diagnosed, and then upwards of ten times a day uh, before I started on an insulin pump. This was what diabetes management consisted of. You peed in test tubes, and you tested your blood sugar and you took syringes. This wasn't what my friends were doing, but this is what I was doing as a small child. So there's been progress in diabetes management tools. This is currently what I'm wearing, uh, an insulin pump. And instead of taking nine to 10 injections a day, I'm infusing subcutaneously the hormone that my body just refuses to make on its own. So this is a very convenient switch from all these syringes going from changing an infusion set every three days, far less needles. And then this is a blood glucose meter, which most people mistake for an iPod, which I think is very, very cool, because it makes it seem like my medical device has progressed along the lines of how everything else has. I actually had a woman on a plane as I was pricking my finger and putting the blood droplet against the top of the meter. She was like, oh, I really like your, your iPod. Why are you bleeding on your iPod? Like, everyone was very uncomfortable about that. But I thought that was cool, because that meant it looks not like diabetes. I didn't look sick. I looked hip. And then this is also what I'm using now. It's a continuous glucose device. It's something that I wear. It's a sensor implanted under my skin, and it takes blood glucose readings every five minutes. So instead of looking at these snapshots of blood sugar results, you know, maybe every four, five, six hours, I was seeing them streaming in real time, like video of what my blood sugars were doing. This is huge progress. This is tremendous progress from peeing in test tubes. And then this is insulin, the, the hormone, like I said, that my body won't make, something that I need to stay alive. I'm using insulin still, but it's just different kinds now. It's just this insulin is fast acting, the other ones were slow acting. Progress, progress, this is what we were looking for. So in terms of support, support has evolved in a similar way. When I was first diagnosed, diabetes support came in the form of diabetes camp. So everyone here up on this slide, counselors included, has type 1 diabetes. It was a camp exclusively for girls with type 1 diabetes. So it was very normal for all of these girls to wake up in the morning and have all your friends around you and you had a fun night like playing in the cabin. And then the nurse would wheel in a trolley full of syringes and we would all shoot up together in the morning. This was what we did. It was very normal for these children to be taking their drug doses before going out and playing archery or running and, and playing softball in the field. But as with the progress of technology, there has been a progress of support. And now instead of relying on diabetes camps, 
I have the access of the internet to find people to connect with. So after diabetes camp, there was this long gap where I didn't know anyone else who had diabetes. I felt like I was the only person, potentially in the world, who was injecting insulin before all of my meals. And I wanted to find people who were not dying from this disease, but were instead living with it and living well with it. And that was really important to me. I needed to see that there was a life to be found after this diagnosis. So I went online and I put diabetes into Google and the search results that came back were really depressing. All these reasons why my life was going to be compromised and why just things were going to be bad, but I wanted to find the reasons why things would be good. So I started a diabetes blog called Six Until Me back in May of 2005 just by saying, hey, I have diabetes. Other people were saying, oh, I do too. And then stories were being shared. And these are just a few of the blogs and most of them are, are American, sorry. But these are just some of the people who are sharing anecdotal Me Too stories about life with type 1 diabetes. This is Diabetes Camp for Grown Ups. And we're also existing on Twitter. I know we've been talking a lot about Twitter. Diabetics are on Twitter having discussions. Sometimes there's structured discussions like the Diabetes Social Media Advocacy Chat that takes place on Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. It, people are just logging onto Twitter and sharing anecdotal bits about their lives with diabetes just out there, just being comfortable saying, yes, I have this and you are not alone. And there's such a power to that. So I, the title of this presentation is what I learned from strangers on the internet. My mom keeps saying, well, what are you actually learning from strangers on the internet? Don't you feel like you're getting enough information from your doctors? And you can get all this information from your doctors about using an insulin pump or what insulins you might want to use. But when it comes to really living with type 1 diabetes, like actually implementing this stuff into your real life, you can't learn that from doctors. You have to learn that from fellow patients. And what I've learned from fellow patients is that you can find hope. I mean, in this photo here, there's over 100 years of type 1 diabetes cumulatively, and we are all still smiling. I think there's a certain power to that. And then also, sorry, Renza, you can find hope and humor in the fact that two people with type 1 diabetes can lovingly embrace an entire tub of Nutella and be comfortable with that and understand the irony of that, but also how to dose their insulin for that. Maybe not the whole tub, but I mean at least a smattering. And then you can also find hope in the things that maybe when you were diagnosed, people said were not possible for you. When I was diagnosed, they said that motherhood was something that I wouldn't achieve personally. I'd never be able to carry a child. All of these bad things. But I mean, I have a beautiful three-year-old, and these other women in the photos are women with type 1 diabetes who have children. They have achieved that dream. They have given me hope. You can't get that from doctors, you get that from strangers on the internet. Because this, this is kind of the core of it. This is a list I had made when I was about nine years old and I shoved it in a book and my mother gave it to me a couple of years ago to remind me. This was the list of things that I needed to do in my head then to keep myself alive. I had to test my blood sugar, no cheating. I couldn't cheat on my diabetes diet. I had to shoot like mom tells me means to take the insulin dose that my mother was recommending. And then to be responsible. Now that last one is the one that really resonates for me because if you're 9, 10, 11 years old, being told to be responsible, being handed your mortality at such a young age and said, well, just figure it out and make sure that you do it right because the consequences are dire. To live with that kind of saps the hope from you. And that is why I think it's important for, for patients, diabetics, or whatever health condition, to be connecting online because we find hope, we find inspiration, and that is something, as I said, that doctors can't teach you. We teach one another. The end. <laughs>